in the 1930s and really by the 1940s, you start to have kind of like gender parades, like show your parts to prove you're a woman, right? So men never have to prove they're men, but women have to prove they're women. Mesdames et messieurs, the greatest festival of our contemporary society, the Olympic Games, is about to begin. This is going to be close. Oh! Welcome to another episode of Olympic Fever, the podcast for Olympics fans. I am your host, Jill Jarris, joined as always by my lovely co-host, Allison Brown. Allison, hello. How are you today? I am doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. Uh, you know, I call it a victory. I jumped some rope this weekend. My uterus is still there. You know, <laughs> and the IOC didn't come knocking to check. No, they didn't. This is, this is a win-win then. <laughs> That's right. That's right. How about yourself? You know, my uterus is fine. It, mm-hmm. it, it, it it hasn't fallen out. I don't overexert myself, though. So I, I do keep, you know, Mr. Brundage in mind whenever I'm <laughs> attempting new athletic feats. Right. Yeah. The break of sweat. Oh, oh. Oh, that, that's, Avery that, Brundage that's, would you know, not approve. And, and that's, well, that's really the sign. If a woman breaks a sweat, it's a, uh, her lady parts are getting ready to fall out. I know. We don't sweat, we glow. Right. right. Remember yeah. that. A proper lady would not sweat. That is so unfeminine of us. Uh, well, we are on our horse again today because we are talking sex and gender with Dr. Victoria Jackson. Dr. Jackson is a sports historian and lecturer of history at the School of Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Studies at Arizona State University. She is a former NCAA champion in the 10,000 meters, and she is also a contributor to Future Tense, a partnership of Slate, New America and Arizona State University that examines emerging technologies, public policy, and society. She authored the article, The Decade-Long Humiliation of Castor Semenya, and that is one of the reasons why we had her on our show to talk about sex and gender, especially in the wake of the Castor Semenya scandal. So take a listen to our interview with Dr. Jackson. Thank you very much, Victoria, for joining us. Uh, We want to talk today about Castor Semenya. And all the recent controversy around it. So I think the best place to start is who is Castor Semenya and why Why do we care? Well, first, um, thanks for having me. Castor Semenya is a middle distance star, track and field athlete star. She's been dominating international competition for the last decade um, in the middle distances specifically. Um, her, her best event is the 800 meters on the track. She's a five-time gold medalist at the Olympics and the world championships. And um, she's been doing this despite um, basically (laughs) her body being unbelievably scrutinized Um, in the 2009 world championships. That was the first time she really um, made a mark on the international scene winning in those championships and the kind of whispers around the track or that she might need to undergo some sort of sex testing. And there's a long history of sex testing at the Olympics. It had been standardized in the past. It went away in the mid 2000s. But if people, if the whispers were loud enough, which is a bad policy, right? People just kind of culturally informed ideas about, you know, what gender categories bodies fit into. If there's enough whispers, then it will come to the attention of the national governing bodies and international governing bodies to then look into the person's body, which is a horrible practice. So anyway, um, she and and a couple other athletes were going through this in the mid 2000s, a couple Indian runners, a middle distance runner and a sprinter as well. And at one point, I I believe a group of these women from the global South were kind of just like whisked away to have gynecological assessments and also kind of aesthetic surgery to make their parts conform more to what we think of as (laughs) female organs. And so keeping in mind, Castor Semenya in 2009 is 18 years old, and the bod- the world is discussing her body. Her medical records were then leaked to um, a media outlet in Australia, 
And I mean, ever since, She's had people basically calling her a man without knowing anything about the science or the genetics behind bodies. And it's a the bigger issue here is that we have two categories of sports competition competition, men's and women's, but we have bodies that fall along multiple spectrums that we try to fit into these two categories of competition. In any other case where we have kind of genetic difference, it's celebrated in sport. So if you're super tall, you're celebrated and play basketball or volleyball or something else that requires a lot of maybe high jumps, something like that. If you have a body that produces more red blood cells than other bodies because of a genetic mutation, that's celebrated too. But when it comes to gender and ideas around gender, and particularly when it's a woman's body, somebody who identifies as a woman, who was born and raised as a woman, who has genetics that are different from what we think of as a kind of typical woman body, then instead of celebrating that difference, we shun it and try to kick, kick it out of sport. When they talk about sex testing, what is that? What does that mean? <laughs> Yes. Well, it was originally introduced because of unfounded fears that men would want to achieve in sports so badly that they basically try to pass as women and achieve in sport as women, or that kind of authoritarian governments would force men to kind of try to pass as women and earn, you know, Olympic glory for their countries. That doesn't happen. And then that's my question is how how often are men masquerading as women in order to win medals? Right. Doesn't happen. And so uh, in the 1930s and really by the 1940s, you start to have kind of like gender parades, like show your parts to prove you're women. Right. So men never have to prove they're men, but women have to prove they're women. It's kind of reinforcing, first of all, an other category that that you don't really belong here. And that speaks to the longer history of the Olympics. The Olympics were men only in their origins and Coubertine into at least the 19 teens and maybe even the 1920s still was very opposed to women competing in the the games. Coubertine, the founder of the modern Olympic movement. So after the kind of show your parts parades, then you'd have to have a verification card, a sex verification card from a medical doctor in order to compete. Later iterations included chromosomal cheek swabs, which are highly problematic. Again, there's no determinant of femaleness. There isn't a singular way to prove one's identity as female. So the chromosomal cheek swabs were um, problematic as well. In more recent years, and this, this has really played out the most in the International Federation for Track and Field, the IAAF, So um, they put forth, right, getting rid of the chromosomal cheek swabs, they put forth hyperandrogenism as the new means to determine whether or not somebody was woman enough to compete in the women's category. And um, Duty Chant, uh, the Indian sprinter, challenged these hyperandrogenism rules, brought it before the Court of Arbitration for Sport, which suspended the hyperandrogenism regulations because they weren't scientifically founded. So we had this long history of cultural ideas informing science policy and sport. No scientific basis for these sorts of tests. Medical doctors kind of working with these governing bodies to confirm um, and just kind of support these regulations because Everybody knows the women's category needs to have some sort of idea of what a woman is in order to compete. So they're very much culturally informed, very much Western, um, so European and American and kind of Commonwealth country informed ideas of what a female body looks like. And we've even heard (laughs) folks from the IAAF using this language about um, kind of what female bodies are supposed to look like as part of why they want athletes like Castor Semenya to reduce their naturally occurring testosterone so they can look more like women and that they should want to look more like women. It's, it's, I mean, when you step outside of it, it, it really becomes tragic 
and, and kind of horrifying to hear the way people talk about somebody they certainly do not empathize with. So after the hyperandrogenism regulations were suspended by CAS, I think the IAAF realized they were not going to be able to find anybody to be able to do a scientific study to support them because they were so just <laughs> clearly off base. So they found a team to do a study um, and they changed it from hyperandrogenism to disorders of, of sexual difference, DSD. And um, they're still looking at testosterone, but they performed a study that showed that the events are cherry picked. They're Castor Semenya's events. <laughs> so they're the middle distance races from 400 meters to the mile. And they ran the numbers basically to confirm their idea that having elevated testosterone was too much of a performance enhancement, um, that it was unfair to other women in the category, that there were no wi typical women with typical testosterone levels above five nanomoles per liter of blood. And so they set that as the target for women with elevated testosterone. They have to now artificially reduce the amount of naturally occurring testosterone to under that five nanomoles per liter, liter of blood for at least six months before being eligible to compete in the women's category of competition. So these are women with DSD. I mean, it, it's basically they wanted to have a study so that Castor Semenya and other 800 meter runners from Africa um, we now know that both the silver medalist in Rio and the bronze medalist in Rio also have spoken publicly that the new DSD regulations will also affect them. So the three medalists from Rio will now, if they want to continue to compete in the event in which they earned their Olympic medals, they'll have to artificially reduce their naturally occurring testosterone. Okay, so there's absolutely no issue with these women taking testosterone artificially. That has never been the controversy. No, it, it's their natural, the, the testosterone that their bodies naturally produce. And they, these are, um, the women who are affected by these regulations are those who do not have androgen insensitivity. So some uh, DSD women produce a lot of testosterone, but their bodies aren't able to use it. The regulations only affect those whose bodies um, do process and use the testosterone. Okay, so is there any medical issue in terms of women have a high testosterone level and this could be a concern medically? So um, I've, I've read different responses to that. So first of all, the study that the IAAF commissioned, an uh, independent team of scientists and academics re-ran the numbers in that study and found that it was seriously flawed. So um, it was a team of a uh, Norwegian, an American, and a South African. Um, the American is, is somebody who I've worked with a bit um, and who's fantastic um, at the University of Colorado. His name is Roger Pielke, Jr. Um, and he and his co-authors have been really trying to, to call out the IAAF and the journal that, that published this study, trying to get the journal to retract it, and they refuse to. So that, that study still doesn't prove what they're trying to prove. And that study showed that um, other events, athletes, with elevated testosterone had even more enhancement in other event categories. So the sprints and some of the throws and some of the jumps, those who had elevated testosterone had more of a competitive advantage. So that again suggests that this is really a case of targeting Castor Semenya and trying to get her out of sport um, as well as the other 800 meter runners. Okay, so, so I, this, I, I just wanna make sure that we're very clear on what the because the IAAF came out with a ruling, I guess it was this month or in the the past few weeks, specifically targeting those middle distances and saying this level of testosterone is acceptable. Anything else, you need to do what? 
Um, okay, so these regulations were released in July or August of 2018. Then when Castor Semenya challenged them before the Court of Arbitration for Sport, they were suspended in November of 2018. And then CAS had its um, hearing in the early spring and the decision had been postponed a bit. So when, at that moment when the CAS decision was postponed. It seemed like that was in response to the United Nations Human Rights Commission becoming involved and flagging this as a serious issue of, of a potential human rights violation. And then um, you could see the IAAF kind of spinning its wheels like, oh, be because the um, the next world championships in track and field um, are less than six months out now, they'll be in Doha in um, Qatar in late September. So they softened the policy of the six months depending on the CAS ruling. But in, in that CAS decision, they, first of all, it, it was not a unanimous vote. It was a three judge panel. It was a two to one vote. And they also flagged three major concerns that they have. The first is that they're very much concerned about potential side effects of forcing women with elevated testosterone to have an, a medical intervention or chemical in intervention to reduce their testosterone. Second, they flagged the 1500 meters and above as two events that the science doesn't support that there's enough of a unfair com competitive advantage for having elevated testosterone. So they asked the IAAF to remove those two events from oversight by the regulations. And now the third is escaping me. Oh, I lost it. But but those two are the, the main ones, right? That we haven't even thought about what it means to make people artificially reduce their naturally occurring testosterone. And two of these events, the 1500 and the mile, don't seem to even be based in science. Is there any other instance where a governing body has said, something of your body has to be artificially altered for you to be able to compete? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't believe so. <laughs> yeah, I, I couldn't find anything, which is why I asked, because I couldn't find anything where they said, if you're over, you know, there's a, a, a top height limit or there is a, you know, other than weight classes. That right. See, and it's interesting that this seems so obviously targeting Castor Semenya, especially when you talk about the other events where <laughs> the elevated testosterone could really help you. So why is nobody whispering about the shot putters or the hammer throw people? Yeah, I mean, it, it really speaks to, again, for, for me as a historian and somebody who's always thinking about, about broader context, at the end of the day, it always comes down to power and fear. And so you can tell people feel threatened by Castor Semenya, feel, people feel threatened. And the rhetoric used, um, this kind of doomsday apocalyptic, women will never be able to compete in the women's category again. You know, they, they won't be able to qualify for the finals ever again, it, unless we do something to regulate those other people. It's, for me, it's, it's protectionist, but it's protectionist in a sense that it's protect, protecting kind of Western notions of, of womanhood, of those who, who don't understand the privilege that they have to compete in the Olympic Games at this level. And, and for, for me, it speaks to the ways in which we kind of glamorize technology and then kind of look down upon people who don't have access to that technology, who are just trying to compete as themselves. I, I find it to be very tragic, but again, an illustration of the power dynamics of those in positions of authority and decision-making in the governing bodies. And then also the athletes who take for granted the easier pathways they have to qualifying for and competing in the games. Now I've seen a lot of commentary by kind of top officials, you know, my, seen a lot, of course, from Sebastian Coe. Has there been a lot of chatter from the other athletes? Yes, so um, that has been interesting to watch for me. I think 
those who haven't spoken out, um, their silence is a way of suggesting that they might agree that there needs to be some sort of restriction, but it's probably not exactly the politically correct thing to do to, to go out and speak out in support of the, the regulations. Madeline Pape, who is one of Castor Semenya's competitors, an Australian 800 meter runner, wrote a great first person op-ed for The Guardian talking about how when she was still competing in sport, she was skeptical of whether it was fair for Castor Semenya to compete in her event and talked about this kind of progression, this, this transformation of, of the way she thought about um, Castor Semenya and, and just kind of more broadly the, the social and cultural context around it um, when she began a PhD program at the University of Wisconsin. And now Castor Semenya is like her favorite athlete. She completely supports her and is especially kind of in awe of Semenya's ability to continue to excel in sport despite all the hate and aggression and anger and attempts to keep her out of sport. Castor Semenya still seems to be able to excel despite all of that and has, has used her platform to really become an icon, a human rights icon of those who might not have kind of conforming typical bodies either around the world and especially in South Africa. So Semenya um, often, if you if you look at her social media feeds, is talking about how she wants to celebrate and support all people to be who they are and compete as they are in sport and especially especially South African youth. Um, as far as other athletes who've spoken out, they have not. <laughs> They have not uh, done themselves any favors. So a uh, Polish 800 meter runner who finished fifth in Rio, people found a quote from her saying she was proud to be the second European. And really she was second in the race because you know, those three Africans, they're not really women. Um, so yeah, I mean, and this, this is when, you know, when, when you hear people pushing back, like, oh, it's not really about race. <laughs> you can point to an athlete speaking like that. And no, she feels comfortable enough to say that publicly. Lots of other people in the track and field community are saying it as well. So Castor Semenya, I know, is obviously Black. And she also, I recently read that she has come out as lesbian as well. Mm -hmm all factoring in, I'm assuming, in, in your opinion, as to why she's being targeted? Oh, absolutely. Because for those who um, have kind of really outdated ideas about bodies and don't understand and, and fall into this place where they conflate sexual orientation and gender identity and biological sex, they assume, oh, well, she likes women. See, that proves for me that she's a man. Right, so, so they're taking all these, as I was saying earlier, right, we have all these categories of identity that are on spectrums, right? So biological sex, gender identity, gender presentation, which is different from gender identity, and sexual orientation, who you love, and those are all separate things. <laughs> and for those who aren't as up to date or up to speed on these, these various spectrums, for them, that just proves, right, see, she's a dude, she's married to a woman, um, and she looks, to me, she looks like a dude, even though women can have muscles too, right? And so kind of all these things. And then you had people saying, well, you failed to mention, you know, I I, I think there was a, I want to say the, the, the place I saw this was this running blog website called Let's Run, they were like, nobody's been talking about the fact that Castor Semenya has Y chromosomes. And like, again, just showing the, the lack of knowledge here, the presence of a Y chromosome does not make one male. <laughs> that was part of the chromosomal cheek swap tests that had been thrown out decades ago. A Y chromosome does not make one male. There are lots and lots and lots and lots of different ways in which women have Y chromosomes and are still women. And that's medical, that's societal. So again, just a lot of ignorance in this space. How, this may be very medical, but how 
do you reduce testosterone levels? How does that actually happen? Yeah, this, this has been another conversation that's been playing out in the aftermath. Again, suggesting and signaling those who came up with this policy really were not thinking about what it really would mean to do this. I think their goal was really just to get these women out rather than provide a pathway for them to stay in sport in the women's category. And so I've, I've seen, you know, one way is medical intervention, so surgery. Another is, I want to say Paula Radcliffe. So she's the um, world record holder in the marathon. She's been part of this discussion and she was kind of putting forth the idea that all it would take is going on uh, oral contraceptive on the pill. I don't think that's necessarily backed up by science, but um, I also know that the vast majority of American elite training groups and distance running um, in the last decade have been getting their athletes to go off oral contraception because it was inhibiting performance. <laughs> and also having uh, side effects, right? There's side effects. Messing with hormones, if you talk to any gynecological doctor, hormones are messy. There, there's always differences in bodies and the ways in which those bodies react to hormones. And I'm not a doctor, so I'm treading cautiously speaking to this, but certainly it, it's, it's unknown potentially <laughs> Um, problematic terrain to start altering the hormones and the hormone levels um, in your body, especially as an elite athlete. Where do you see this going? What do you see as the outcome for Castor Semenya? So they are um, now going through the legal system in Switzerland um, because of, I think, a lot of breaches and um, kind of just legal problematic issues that went on during the CAS arbitration. Castor Semenya's legal team is now challenging all of that in Swiss court. You know, she, she's gone on record to say that she's not going to reduce her testosterone. It was pretty bold of the IAAF to double down and, and not take the 1500 off of the events included in these regulations. I think Cass gave them a kind of way out and they were like, screw that, we're all in. And I think a lot of people assumed, oh, that would happen and she'd just compete in the 1500 at the World Championships in Doha, but that didn't happen. Um, she's competing in the Prefontaine Classic um, coming up soon in the 3000. And that made me laugh um, because the 3000 is kind of a relic of the age not very long ago when it when the 3000 meter steeplechase was considered to be too dangerous for women <laughs> so right you can't run the 3000 meter steeplechase we'll give you a flat 3000 instead so again just another example of this kind of unfounded science protecting women um, and you know restricting the ways they're allowed to compete in sport okay so here's my real question what is sebastian coe's problem a really good question. Yeah, he, he is a fascinating individual to me. And for me, it opens up a greater kind of critique, growing critique I have of Nike. I mean, there's a there's a building named for Sebastian Coe on Nike's campus. Castor Semenya is a Nike athlete. <laughs> Paula Radcliffe, somebody else who kind of increased the kind of hysteria by speaking publicly about the death of women's sports, another Nike athlete. And then Nike produces all these kind of inspirational ads around Castor Semenya. Like they're at, they know how to market wokeness, that's for sure. But is Nike really at the end of the day more in support of the head of the IAAF, Sebastian Coe, who was a Nike athlete, who has a building on their campus? And Paul Radcliffe, who does appearances for Nike, who's the world record holder in the marathon. Like, it's fascinating how, how, I mean, I feel like I keep getting played by Nike because I'm like, wow, that Castor Semenya ad is so freaking cool. But then I think more about it, like, wait a second, they're just capitalizing off of all of this. <laughs> well, and that brings up a couple of different things with when you talk about Nike. Have they said anything about 
the, what their position is on her since she is a current Nike athlete? Or have they been pretty quiet? Yeah, you know, it, one of the kits she was wearing recently didn't look like a Nike kit. And I was like, oh my gosh, are, is she no longer with Nike? I, I don't know. There's been a lot of silence. And it would be really interesting to see how they navigate this. The The Dream Crazy ads with Caster Semenya are through the Nike YouTube feed. So they're certainly still using her, using her in marketing. But... I mean, if I was Castor Semenya and I was like, wait a second, Nike has a building named for the guy who's trying to kick me out of my sport, like, <laughs> it would give me pause. <laughs> well, and then Nike's got another issue going on with how they've dealt with pregnant athletes. And I know you're, you've uh, been speaking out about this as well. Yes. So um, Alicia Montano, who's a multiple time Olympian and world championship competitor, she kind of had this tragic story where she finished off the podium in Castor Semenya's event, actually the 800 meters multiple times, and then had those medals upgraded when uh, women who fit it, finished ahead of her were um, testing positive for banned substances. And then she became kind of world famous when she competed in the US trials eight months pregnant and did that to raise awareness and generate a conversation and inspire women to remain active during pregnancy. Again, these kind of pseudoscientific ideas about what a woman is supposed to do while pregnant not informed by reality or actual real science. So she wanted to do that to show women, you know, if you were active before you were pregnant, you can be active during your pregnancy too. And the, so what happened was Nike suspended her. Um, she was a Nike athlete. When she told the company she was pregnant, they're like, great, that's awesome. Once you're back to uh, the fitness that's ready for world competition, we'll start paying you again. Like, stating that in a positive supportive way like we're not going to drop you we'll bring you back once you're ready to compete again well what that does to women athletes is it causes financial stress it causes serious anxiety and fear and guilt um and then it also kara goucher another nike athlete who um uh was a <laughs> pregnant and then ended up switching companies because of the way she was treated during her pregnancy and postpartum recovery, talked about how hard it was for her emotionally and how guilty she would feel because she felt compelled to rush back into competition. So she felt like she needed to maintain fitness and competitive elite, like ready for competition fitness through the pregnancy so that she could return to competition in time to qualify for another Olympics or international competition. I can't remember which year it was, um, less than six months postpartum. That, like, wouldn't it be great if companies just committed to, and so the purpose of um, this dream maternity video that Alicia Montano produced um, in partnership with the New York Times opinion and media teams and Lindsey Krauss, the um, opinion writer for the New York Times, was the producer of this, this whole enterprise. Um, what they wanted to do was call out Nike for, again, kind of advertising and messaging equal opportunity and combating of misogyny and gender, in, uh, gender inequality and discrimination and celebrating female athletes and supporting female athletes. So like, if you watch those ads, you're like, yeah, Nike supports women except they weren't supporting their elite women, especially those who were choosing to have families. You know, Alicia Montano kind of did the morning, the morning news show circuit, and she kept talking about, well, these are men at these companies making decisions about contracts and support kind of from a template that is for male athletes. They're not thinking about women. There aren't enough women making decisions about how best to support and encourage women in sport. And if, if we had a company culture that committed to maternity support, it would also be reflected in the contracts for these athletes. 
So her, that video threw a lot of shade. Yeah, so again, kind of advertising, right? Nike not practicing what it preaches. I think it's interesting. I remember at Sochi, I believe it was a Canadian curler who was five months pregnant and competing. And everybody was all up in arms about what if, she, you know, it was like suddenly everybody got their obstetrics degree and was <laughs> right. telling her how to live her life while she was pregnant. Yeah. So it seems like that's pervasive throughout yeah. sport. And there's a long history here too. You know, the, the medical knowledge in the 1920s through really the 1970s was that if women ran more than 800 meters, they'd be barren, their uterus would fall out. Like, like literally you have doctors doing this. Um, then like when, and, and again, it's, it's all about protecting power and privilege. It's not about protecting women. It's protecting ideas about sport is the men's domain. So if you look at the little league lawsuits, you have like a doctor testifying under oath in a courtroom in New Jersey saying that girls are going to get breast cancer if they get hit in the chest with the baseball. And again, like you, you, you're just making it up as you go because you don't want your little boys to have to play sports with little girls. <laughs> and I mean, my goodness, like the emasculating experience of being beaten by a girl. Um, so yeah, there's this very long history of this in sports. Yeah, don't get me continue. started. <laughs> don't get me started on the number of uteruses that people find on the ski jump hills. Because yes, when... <laughs> yes. That's a really great example because ski jumping is potentially an event where women could outperform men because their bodies are better built to excel in ski jumping. So of course you're gonna try to come up with excuses to keep women out of ski jumping, right? They're gonna break or they won't be able to have kids or all of these sorts of ideas. And then the other really great example from Olympic history is skeet shooting. <laughs> so skeet shooting was mixed gender. <laughs> And I mean, it's so, it's like, when I tell this, it's so predictable what happens if you know about the ways in which men in power want to keep women out of sport. So mixed gender skeet shooting competition, Barcelona 1992 Olympics, a Chinese woman earns gold, right? So she beat the, the men. <laughs> what do you think happens in the next Olympics in Atlanta in 1996? <laughs> no more mixed gender. Right. So how do you think that plays out? Like, what are the new, what are the new competitions in Atlanta? So Barcelona, 92, mixed gender, a woman wins. Atlanta, 96, there's a skeet shooting competition. And it's only men. And it's only men. So they don't have two categories, men's and women's. They make it men only. So the defending gold medalist can't defend her title. And then what, what like, so what, I use this in class and I like ask my students, they're like, oh, there's two categories of competition. Like, no, it's worse. They just have the men. And then to just kind of like stick it to her even more, rub salt in the wound. In Sydney 2000, they introduced the first women's skeet shooting competition. Like, so it fits into this narrative of like expanding opportunities for women in the Olympics. So it turns into this like positive, we believe in gender equity story, except the real history is that women were excelling, beating men, kicked out because of that. And then eight years later, reintroduced in a separate women's only category. <laughs> you know, but it, it's also interesting that now the IOC wants to have all these mixed gender competitions maybe they that you have competing teams made up of both genders competing against each other to make this seem better i i don't know it just doesn't they're trying too hard to find a way to placate <laughs> people without actually them having to really change how they think it almost yeah seems. yeah and then you know i think they don't they don't think about unintended consequences because i do i see some like I see mixed gender ultimate frisbee as like a great way to kind of debunk these ideas and and the team sports I think are the way to do it because when you have these individual sports 
what what often happens in like archery and other shooting or things where there's a potential to compare across both gender categories, you make it slightly different so that the results can no longer be compared. Um, so the distances might be different or the number of shots that are taken might be different. So it becomes a little bit harder to compare results. But the team competition, I think, is interesting to see if that if that ends up happening. I think there's a lot of potential there to kind of loosen our attachment and commitment to sex segregated sport or gender segregated sport. Well, thank you so much, Victoria. This has been fantastic. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Victoria. You can follow Victoria on Twitter at historyrunner.com, and we'll have a link to that in our show notes. We'll, we're also going to have a, a few links to some of uh, the articles we talked about, particularly the story Starfish Girl by Maureen McHugh, and we'll have uh, Dr. Jackson's response to that as well, and a link to her Castor Semenya story. You know, I, I don't even know where to start with that, because it the whole the whole topic i just shake my head and that's not good podcasting good podcast it's not me shaking my head but that's that's what i'm doing here we could have had seven episodes with dr jackson <laughs> because there were so many issues that we just kind of it could touch upon briefly you know the whole idea of nike with the supporting women when they become pregnant and have to stop competing and then coming back and i had posted on facebook uh, an article about Allison Felix, mm -hmm. uh, track and field star, talking about her relationship with Nike and their support of pregnant athletes. So it's it's a multi-layered cornucopia <laughs> of a honeycomb <laughs> wrapped in an enigma. I mean, I don't know why it's such a I mean, it's such a complex issue in society. So why wouldn't it be a complex issue in sports? But it feels like it should be simpler in sports. Yeah, you would than think. Than it is. But yeah, the idea of change is probably very hard for many people to take. As is always the case. And we know when we spoke to um, Sarah Hendrickson about ski jumping and the whole idea of the IOC really concerned about a woman's future fertility, I'm like, let me worry about that. Thanks. <laughs> right, right. All right, moving on to our Team Olympic Fever update. <laughs> It was another big weekend for our artistic swimmer, Jacqueline Simino. Uh, she uh, had a couple more medals in Greensboro for uh, the next, st the latest stop on the FINA World Cup. And then they're going to head to Quebec City soon, and I'm sure she'll be competing there as well. Our Team Olympic Fever modern pentathlete, Samantha Achterberg, was uh, got 28th place in the most recent World Cup in Prague. Uh, and I know that doesn't sound very good, but oh my gosh, her semifinal, she did really well. Her fencing was a lot better than it has been. And Excellent. she, in the semi, she had like the fastest time on the laser run overall, which was her pretty amazing. Spot. Yeah, I know. Yeah. yeah, her favorite. And she did, of course, did, had a really good time on the laser run again in the finals. But when they talked about overall goals, and she was talking about it too, she uh, was three for three in making all of the finals at the World Cup she's competed in, which is really good. She's seen the incremental progress that's going to help get her to Tokyo. So, Outstanding. Very, I'm very proud of her. And Keegan Randall's been on a mission. There is no grass growing under her feet. No, no. She... And not just because she's living in Alaska. <clears throat> Um, she is now an official ambassador for Active Against can Cancer. That's A-K-T-I-V, Against Cancer. Their mission is to ensure that physical activity becomes an integral part of cancer treatment. And uh, you can find out more at activeagainstcancer.org. And she's also going to be in Grand Rapids, Michigan in a few weeks. There is the MSU Grand Fondo 7 bike ride happening, and that's a fundraiser for skin cancer. And Keegan and Christian Vandeveld are going to be at a high-carb dinner the night before the ride. So the ride happens on June 22nd, and if you raise enough money, you could get an invite to the high-carb dinner with Keegan and Christian. I can get behind a high-carb dinner. I know, right? If anybody goes, let us know. Oh, yeah. Our Team Olympic Fever 
sport climber Josh Levin has been busy competing on American Ninja Warrior. There are some videos online of him in like the doorknob challenge. They're doing like head to head challenges. So it's really a lot of fun. Is there any part of his body that isn't perfectly chiseled? I don't know. I don't think so. (laughs) Holy cow. Our sustainability expert, M. Camp, recently hosted a Q&A panel at Think Sports is the Spot, which is a network of international sports institutions, businesses, and academic organizations dro- joining forces to drive talent and innovation in sports. So it's nice to see that conferences are really concerned with the issue of sustainability as well. And speaking of uterus. Yeah, right? Oh, this is such good news. Oh, super fan Sarah. And her husband, Nick, are expecting a baby this Yay! fall. Yay! So Team USA's newest fan will be here in a few months. We're very excited for you yes. both. Yes. Yay! All right, moving on to Tokyo 2020 news. Now, this is very confusing. Why? Because Aiba's out, but boxing's in. Okay, right. And this happened, the announcement came like literally a couple hours after we taped last week's show. So yes. We, we didn't talk about the big news. Uh, one of the items from last week's IOC uh, Executive Board Commission meeting was discussing what they're going to do about boxing for Tokyo because they've had issues with the AIBA for ever. Ever. Uh, yeah. And, um, but the fact the matter is they want to still be able to have boxing as a sport in Tokyo and not hurt the athletes by just kicking AIBA out. But they are going to recommend to the full commission meeting, which is happening this June, that boxing will be in Tokyo. The IOC will figure out how to run the boxing tournament, but the AIBA will not have a part of it. Which is amazing. And it's interesting because you saw, I saw the different headlines where the IOC press release was like, oh, the EB recommends boxing keep its place on the Tokyo 2020 sports program and suspension of the recognition of AIBA. <laughs> Meanwhile, like the Guardian, AIBA stripped of right to run boxing tournament at Tokyo, Tokyo Olympics. <laughs> right. The IOC trying to couch this saying, yeah, right? we're going to have boxing. And just so you know, Aiba... It's not going to be involved. And everyone else is like, Aiba's out. Aiba's out. <laughs> I don't yeah. know what this actually means for the athletes. I mean, it means that they have the opportunity to compete in Tokyo, yes. But in terms of are we going to get a cleaner tournament? Are we going to get better officiating? Are we going to have fewer issues with judging? I hope so. I'm not confident because where are you going to get all these clean judges? Right. And there's there's a couple of different elements, too, because the World Boxing Federation, so there are a couple of different federations, they've offered to help organize this. Oh, because it's the professional body. So that could be uh, an issue because it's not necessarily a recognized federation by the IOC. And because professional boxing is known to be such a clean and scandal free zone right that's a, that's a great <laughs> substitute for the AIBA so there's that and then the IOC decided to create a task force to come up with some kind of solution for this boxing competition and they put in charge a man named uh, Morinari Watanabe and his his experience really isn't with boxing he uh, is the International Gymnastics Federation president, and so he he said in an article on Inside the Games that uh, he'd been instructed a couple days prior to chair this task force, and he's like, uh, I, I don't, I wasn't really prepared for this. I wasn't expecting it, but I, I'm going to Lausanne to analyze the situation, come up with a plan. Okay, I, I have two things to say to that. First, because gymnastics is so scandal-free right now. Let, let's get a gymnastics official to, to clean up the mess. But on the other hand, if you have ever been in a gymnastics gym, you know those girls can throw down. So he may know more about boxing than he thinks he does. <laughs> they may be but little, but they are fierce. We shall see. We'll keep an eye on it because boxing is still still there. 
<sighs> but uh, God, I hope for the athletes this this is going to be okay. We're just yeah, going to keep keep hoping. Well, on that exciting note, I think we should call it a day, call it an episode. I don't know if my uterus can handle much more. We may be down for the count. That's right. That's right. So, <laughs> we're on the ropes, man. Right. So next week uh, we'll be talking about the 2026 bids because that was another thing they they talked about at this uh, IOC commission. And there's they released a kind of interim report. So we'll be taking a look at it to to compare the two bids and uh, see if anybody has a clear edge going into the vote, which is going to be next month. So. Tune back in next week for that. We'd like to take a second to thank our Patreon patrons. They uh, help us by supporting the show and uh, providing much needed funds to help keep us going. And if you'd like to get in on the action, you can join at patreon.com slash Uh Patreon patrons at certain levels get bonus content, which is the end of the month. So I'm going to be putting together some bonus content for you soon. And, and we got a lot of good stuff for bonus content this month. We we do have a lot of good. <laughs> we do. We, yeah. I'm very excited about bonus excited content well. this month. Yeah. And then also don't forget that our book club is reading Making Waves by Shirley Babishoff, which is about uh, swimming at the Montreal 1976 Olympics. Shirley competed for the USA and she had to compete against uh, East German swimmers who were part of a systemic doping program. So you can get that through our website, uh, olimfever.com. We've got a little book club section. And if you click on the link and shop through Amazon, we get a little cut of those purchases. And again, that greatly helps support the show. So we appreciate that. And on that note, we'll I'm going to go back to my corner. Uh, yeah, exactly. I could keep the boxing <laughs> puns and metaphors going all day. On that note, I'm going to give Allison a standing 10 count while we wrap it up for this week. We'll catch you back here next week for more Olympic stories. And thank you so much for listening. Until next time, keep the flame alive. Stay in touch. Email us at olimfever at gmail.com. That's O-L-Y-M fever at gmail. You can also leave us a voicemail at 530-763-3837. That's 530-70-FEVER. We're on Twitter at Olymp Fever, and you can join in the conversation at our Facebook group, Olympic Fever Podcast. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, keep the flame alive. I can get behind a high-carb dinner.